you're now watching. Around the Horn. The weekly internationalist news update with author and historian Gerald Horn. Okay, today is April 3rd, 2024. Welcome everyone to the weekly series entitled Around the Horn, which is an internationalist news update with Gerald Horn. Gerald Horn currently holds the Morris Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Gerald Horn is an activist, scholar, researcher, archivist, uh, author, historian, attorney, and much, much more. Dr. Horn has written at least 47 books. His most recent book, which is edited by Tian Alia Paris, is entitled, I Dare Say, a Gerald Horn Reader, which is sort of the greatest hits of Dr. Horn's writings. Dr. Horn is also a permanent guest on the radio show, The Horn Report, which airs on Black Power 96 Radio on Sundays at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And Dr. Horn is also, also hosts a radio show entitled Freedom Now, which airs on KPFK 90.7 FM on Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific. And replays of both shows can be found on the Activist News Network. Dr. Horn, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome to around, welcome back to Around the Horn. Thank you for inviting me. Well, as we go around the horn, one of the first things I wanted to ask you about is the recent elections in Turkey. Last May uh, 2023, President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan won the presiden presidential election in Turkey, defeating the opposition candidate who was backed by the U.S. However, this past Sunday, March 31st, the opposition Republican People's Party, CHP, defeated er Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, AKP, in municipal elections for the first time in 20 years. The head of the CHP, Ozgur Ozel, I may be pronouncing his name incorrectly, described the outcome of the, of the election as a, quote, historical result and a, quote, clear signal to the incumbent government. Dr. Horn, what is the significance of Turkey's election this past Sunday? And what are the potential repercussions domestically for the region and beyond? Well, the impact of this election is seismic. It's a political earthquake. And unlike past weeks when I lay out a narrative and then make a proposal, uh, let me make the proposal up front because this needs to be hammered and reinforced repeatedly. That is to say, given the weight that Turkey or Turkey plays in the international community and given the historical associations between uh, Turkey, Turkey, and particularly Black Americans, it's well past time for the Muslims in our community, not least Black American Muslims, to organize a broad delegation to go to Ankara, the capital, and to Istanbul, the major city, and lobby our platform, lobby on behalf of our platform, particularly with regard to reparations, with regard to the cost and price of the African slave trade, particularly with regard to getting Ankara support concerning our efforts at the United Nations with regard to police terror, perhaps leading to sanctions against the US government because of its lethargy and cracking down on police terror that disproportionately leads to the deaths of all too many uh, black people, not to mention our overrepresentation on death row, uh, not to mention our overrepresentation with regard to infant mortality rates. Now, I noted at the top that Ankara and Black Americans in particular have had a long-standing relationship. Recall that the apparent loser of this recent election, President Erdogan, whenever he visits Washington, and he's been in office for a few decades now, he makes a beeline to visit with Black American Muslims in the vicinity of the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. And this is a throwback to an era when Turkey, Ottoman Turkey, as it was then called, uh, saw, saw itself and in fact was seen widely by Muslims as the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, after all, a good deal of Africa 
was under the jurisdiction of Ottoman Turkey for hundreds of years, including the pivotal country that is Egypt, uh, not to mention the uh, sites of the, the holy sites of the religion, speaking of uh, Mecca and Medina and Saudi Arabia. And it's clear that when President Erdogan was reaching out to uh, black Americans in the district, Maryland, Virginia, it was not just a courtesy visit, he had an agenda in mind, and we need to reciprocate by having an agenda in mind. And also keep in mind that a major uh, opponent of his regime, uh, speaking of Fatullah Gulen, lives outside of Philadelphia, and the United States refuses to extradite him to the consternation of Mr. Erdogan. And this brings us to another story, which is that the Gulenists, as they're called, operate one of the more elaborate chains of charter schools in Black American communities from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And we perhaps, in consultation with uh, other comrades on this side of the Atlantic, need to also talk about sending a delegation to meet with Fatula Gulen, although keeping in mind that uh, that may burn a bridge to, to Ankara. And you mentioned that the CHP, the Social Democratic Oriented, uh, Liberal Oriented uh, Opposition Party, attained a stunning victory in this most recent election. Well, this brings to mind the fact that the late great Black American writer James Baldwin, whose 100th anniversary we're marking, uh, when he was in exile, he not only was in exile in France, he was in exile for years in Istanbul. And the same could be said for a number of, of other uh, Black American exiles. And I should also mention that uh, with regard to the historic weight that Ottoman Turkey has played in the international community, as I talk about in my book on the 16th century, uh, one of the many reasons that led to the invasion of the Americas by the Western Europeans, particularly the Spanish, had to do with the fact that in the middle of the 15th century, the Muslims uh, ousted the Christians from ruling in what is now Istanbul, what used to be called Constantinople, and seemed to be on the march heading westward and almost as a defensive maneuver, you saw the Western Europeans begin to flee across the Atlantic, where they stumbled uh, in, onto the Caribbean and onto the Americas, which, of course, uh, ignites the uh, onset of the unlimited African slave trade. So there are many reasons why uh, we should be paying more attention uh, to this important country, which is the bridge between Europe and Asia. And that brings us to the election because as we go down the list, uh, we'll see that Turkey plays a key role in numerous nations. So think of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which has waxed and waned over the years, but most recently Azerbaijan has been able to prevail, not least because they were supplied by drones that are manufactured by a company controlled by Mr. Erdogan's son-in-law. And Armenia, which boasts about its historic connections to Christianity, and of course is very close to its compatriots on this side of the Atlantic, including former California governor, uh, George, Duke, George Duke Mason, uh, writer from California, William Saroyan, not to mention the Kardashian family. And that connection led to an ill-considered decision by Armenia to snuggle up <laughs> to uh, Uncle Sam, although historically, uh, Armenia had seen Russia as its protector. And once that protection was removed, uh, you saw that Arz Azerbaijan was able to prevail. But that's not the only uh, import uh, of this uh, important country that bridges Europe and Asia. I'm also thinking of the conflict in Syria. Recall that when Mr. Erdogan first came to power a few decades ago, he adopted a slogan that was so magnetic that I almost adopted it myself, which is zero problems with neighbors. 
uh, which seems to be a way to conduct not only uh, diplomatic affairs, but personal affairs. <laughs> but alas, as of 2024, uh, because of ham-fisted diplomacy and ill-considered decisions, uh, Turkey, Turkey has multiple problems with multiple neighbors, starting with the nation with which it shares a border. Sp speaking of Syria, uh, many of the problems in Syria, uh, which is spreading like an oil spot throughout the region, recall just what happened a, a day or two ago when the Israelis bombed an Iranian consulate in Damascus, uh, the problems in Syria in many ways begins with Turkey, Turkey, uh, which broke off a positive relation uh, with Syria. In fact, the two leaders, Mr. al-Assad and Mr. Erdogan, were quite personally close. And the weakening of Syria in turn has led to this uh, incursion uh, repeatedly uh, into Syria by the Israelis, the United States, is occupying a good deal of Syrian territory, uh, accused of stealing Syrian oil. Of course, th the trigger uh, for this uh, escapade has to do quite a bit with the fact that uh, Mr. Erdogan and his party uh, have uh, unresolved uh, issues with the Kurdish minority uh, in Turkey. And that led to this incursion across uh, the border. And I think it's also fair to say that uh, despite uh, Mr. Erdogan and his party being close to Hamas, uh, now in a death match, a genocidal conflict with Israel in historic Palestine, and being close to the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been close to Hamas, uh, Mr. Erdogan has been engaged in muscular rhetoric, uh, but not necessarily muscular action. In fact, one could be uh, accurate to accuse them of a certain kind of posturing uh, with regard to this important conflict. Uh, with regard to Russia, uh, Mr. Erdogan has been playing a double game. On the one hand, uh, his country has acted like a sieve, uh, allowing goods to flow uh, into Russia, helping to account for the fact that uh, Russia's economic growth is higher than that of Germany and most of the European Union. In fact, a subject we should be discussing sooner rather than later is how this rise of Russia, or Russia's resurrection, to cite the title of a recent book, is having a profound import on the global correlation of forces that our movement really needs to play, uh, pay careful and close attention to. But on the other hand, uh, Mr. Erdogan, his aforementioned son-in-law at least, has been making a small fortune by selling drones to Ukraine, uh, which has been responsible for uh, many deaths of Russian soldiers on the battlefield. And then of Turkey, Turkey has very conflicted relations with France. And given the fact that France is pretension to being a major power, has a lot to do with its role as a neo-colonial chieftain in a good deal of Africa, uh, this is at the root of the conflict between uh, these two powers. Uh, indeed, if you dig deeply into the conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which we will deal with later today, if not next week or coming weeks, you see that uh, Turkey is playing a major role in the economy of the DRC. There's a major financial center that has just been constructed there. Uh, that, that's quite impressive, uh, by the way. And obviously, uh, this has not been pleasing to France, even though we know that France was the colonial power in the other Congo across the Congo River, speaking of the Republic of the Congo, a Congo of Brazzaville. But given the fact that Belgium was the colonial power in the larger uh, Congo, now the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and a significant percentage of Belgium's contemporary population is French speaking. And given the fact that uh, fr French was the language of the colonizer that was then exported to Africans in the DRC, obviously that created an opening uh, for Paris. But France and Turkey have also clashed over uh, Israel, France being closer to Israel, uh, Turkey, Turkey at least issuing 
uh, stinging rebukes of Israel. And then, uh, given the fact that a good deal of Africa uh, has substantial Muslim populations, uh, that has created an opening uh, for Ankara, uh, which is now the power behind the throne in Somalia, responsible for everything from garbage pickup to airport security after France and the United States and NATO bombed Gaddafi out of power more than a decade ago. We now see that helping to pick up the pieces, or at least, I should say, enmeshed in the continuing conflict in Libya is, you guessed it, Turkey. And of course, with regard to Senegal, we know about the recent election, uh, with President Fai, who has suggested that he will be seeking to move away from France, given the fact that Senegal is heavily Muslim, this means, or should probably mean, that Turkey would be playing a powerful role in that West African country as well. I mentioned NATO a moment or two ago, and keep in mind that Turkey is a member of NATO, although its relations with the United States of America have been, shall we say, complicated, uh, having a lot to do with the fact that the United States would not supply Ankara with the uh, fighter planes that it desired, given the fact that Ankara is playing a double game with regard to Russia, which is at least public enemy number two behind China as far as Washington is concerned. And that brings us to the attempted overthrow of his regime in 2016, uh, which was not necessarily uh, opposed, shall we say, euphemistically uh, by Washington. And despite a massive purge by Erdogan following this failed coup, he still has an uncertain hold uh, over the military uh, which sees itself as the guardian of secularism. Mr. Erdogan and his party are, as they say in the uh, mainstream press in the United States, a soft Islamicist, that is to say that uh, they are hardly secularists, which then complicates relations with the military. And then uh, Turkey has a complicated relations with the European Union. Uh, it has sought to enter the EU but has been rebuffed repeatedly, even though it's clearly a European nation. But this has a lot to do with Islamophobia. This has a lot to do with the fact that when Britain exited the European Union in Brexit in 2016, a part of the hysteria was about that Turkey was about to enter the EU and therefore Muslim workers would be flooding into British labor markets. We already know that Turkish workers or a major force propelling the economy of the Federal Republic of Germany. And that's been the case for decades. So uh, let me say that uh, there are many good reasons for uh, our community, by our community speaking, not only the black community, but I would also say the US left as well, uh, to reach out uh, to Ankara, but also to consider carefully uh, reaching out to the opposition, uh, that is to say Fatula Gulen, uh, now cited <laughs> outside of Philadelphia of all places. And of course, uh, the CHP, uh, the winner of the recent election, uh, and of course, are favored now to win the presidency. And given the uh, rather parlous state of affairs in the United States of America, uh, like James Baldwin some decades ago, uh, there may be those amongst us who may have to seek exile uh, in Istanbul uh, sooner rather than later, which therefore argues for reaching out to Ankara sooner rather than later. Thank you, Dr. Horn, for outlining and, and providing such a thorough and detailed response. We have uh, one question already in the chat that I think uh, um, speaks nicely to what you've been discussing. Uh, it's from Luis Magianes. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing Luis's last name correctly. And the question is, can we expect more of Turkey to play both sides like they've been doing recently, or will they learn more towards the uh, lean, excuse me, more towards the West post elections? It's hard to say. I mean, I think that Mr. Erdogan will be president for at least a, a few more years and his party may continue on uh, after he departs the scene, uh, sees himself as some sort of chess master, some sort of uh, diplomatic player, 
Uh, as he sees it, he's benefited handsomely from playing this double game, uh, reaching out both to Russia and to Ukraine and Ukraine's backers. Uh, and of course, that perhaps argues for a continuation uh, of that policy, which brings us to the CHP. I'm, I'm not so sure uh, what their foreign policy will be. Uh, recall that these elections were mostly uh, local elections where the issues at hand were oftentimes uh, domestic issues with regard to education, with regard to taxes, uh, et cetera. So this is an important country. It's been an important country for hundreds of years. It plays a historic role in historic Palestine before being defeated in World War I more than a century ago. Historic Palestine was fundamentally under the jurisdiction of the Ottoman Turks. And uh, this is a country we need to pay much more careful attention to, particularly, let me reiterate, given the fact that the Gulenists are operating these charter schools in the black community. And as you know, the teachers unions uh, have a critique of charter schools. They see them as a threat to public education, to tax dollars going to public schools. So uh, I, I think we're missing the boat if we do not uh, follow up and try to have a Muslim-led delegation uh, be the path to the corridors of power in Ankara. And uh, to what extent do you think that Erdogan's kind of double game um, in terms of, uh, of of Palestine or his lack of support, other than other than you know big talk, um, impacted this election? You know, the Erdogan, Turkey is known to be providing Israel with, with substantial amount of food and and sort of keeping Israel's food supply going. Uh, meanwhile, really doing nothing but talk in terms of supporting Palestinian resistance, to what extent uh, do you think that impacted this election? Well, I, I think it's part of a chain of events, uh, a chain of missteps. Uh, that is to say that I, I think that the destabilization of Syria uh, plays a role or played a role with regard to the lessening of the popularity of Mr. Erdogan and his party. I think that uh, there is a growing opposition pan-European opposition to this escapade, this caper in Ukraine. And obviously, as noted, uh, Mr. Erdogan's son-in-law is profiting handsomely from the Turkish role in that conflict. Uh, that does not necessarily appeal to poor working class voters uh, who would like to see uh, more attention to health care and more attention to education. And then, as noted, uh, going back to the Turkish defeat in World War I, uh, which sets in motion a chain of events leading to the rise of the founding father of modern Turkey, speaking of Kemal Ataturk. And this was a political earthquake uh, when Kemal Ataturk surged into power uh, because what we saw then was what has continued, which is a very strong trend towards secularism. And many Turks take that historic current very seriously. And as noted, uh, Mr. Erdogan has been retreating uh, to a degree uh, from secularism, and that too played a role in this election. Um, would you like to uh, turn to questions from the audience, Dr. Horn, or go on to our next? Well, sure, I mean, how many are there? There's two questions from the audience, two additional questions from the audience. Sure. Okay, so uh, the next question um, is, I'm hoping Dr. Horn could unpack the complicated web of nations that are preparing to intervene in Haiti. I do wanna note for the audience that Jamima Pierre is scheduled to come on the Activist News Network on Friday at 5 p.m. And this is definitely a question that we will be po that, that I will be posing to her but I would love to hear your answers, of course, Dr. Warren, not to try to take the mic away from you, um, but I would love to hear your answer to this. Well, I would also point to uh, Jamima's appearance on Democracy Now! this morning, along with Kim Ives. Um, there was apparent uh, lack of unity uh, with regard to the role of the paramilitary forces, 
which Kim Ives seemed to see as a revolutionary force. Uh, Jamima did not seem to agree. But with regard to the question on the table, what's happening, as I'm sure Jamima will inform your audience, is that the Canada is training Bahamian and Belizean and perhaps even Jamaican forces to go into Haiti. This apparently is response to the evident thwarting of bringing Kenyan troops across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. We know that Canada, the United States and France have been playing an outsized role in the internal affairs of Haiti. My own recommendation is that uh, we strive to get the Cubans at the table because Cuba plays a role in terms of social welfare in Haiti, in terms of providing medics, for example, to the extent that we get Cuba involved in this crisis. And of course, that does not preclude uh, what Jamima hammers home at every opportunity, which is uh, Haitian solutions to Haitian problems. But to the extent that we get that close neighbor uh, involved, it tends to curb, if not erode, the attempted diplomatic isolation uh, of Havana. And it tends to be a chip or an erosion of the um, blockade, the embargo that the United States has engineered for decades now. And uh, I think hopefully it could lead down the road to something that many folk in the Caribbean ha have been discussing, uh, going back to the days of the attempted federation of decades ago. Uh, that is to say, ever closer ties between these small nations. After all, Cuba is considered the giant of the Caribbean and its population is about, what, 12 or 13 million. And then you have even smaller nations like Grenada and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, St. Lucia, et cetera, all of which, of course, uh, Cuba plays a major role in. So uh, I would like to see a one-two punch with regard to this uh, crisis in Haiti. Uh, number one, as noted, uh, Haitian solutions to Haitian problems. And then number two, uh, trying to have a win-win by allowing Cuba to play a more significant role with their diplomatic acumen. I, I mean, after all, I mean, it was the Cuban diplomacy that helped to resolve the crisis in Southern Africa that led to the April 1994 elections in South Africa that brought Nelson Mandela to power. Uh, that historic event uh, would have been delayed before uh, Cuban diplomacy, not to mention uh, Cuban armed intervention in that part of the world. Thank you for that. And we will we will definitely be addressing the question you raised at the top that, that came up on Democracy Now! about Jimmy uh, Barbecue uh, with, with Dr. Pierre on, on Friday. And, and I personally uh, sort of side with her agnostic view regarding him and the other paramilitary groups. The next question is sort of a historical question. If today's show has time for it, I would really appreciate hearing Dr. Horn, Gerald Horn's understanding of the uh, Ogaden conflict and how Marxists should understand how that developed. Uh, Horn of Africa is complex. <laughs> complex indeed. And uh, the two minutes I'm about to <laughs> subject this complicated question to does not do justice. So I guess we'll have to uh, rearrange another time and opportunity to speak to it. But just to start in the 1970s, recall that the conflict over the Ogaden uh, helped to destabilize uh, both Somalia, uh, which, believe it or not, uh, seemed to be on a non-capitalist path to development at that particular moment, but was induced to attack neighboring Ethiopia, which seemingly was on a similar path. And the conflict between these two nations weakened both, uh, 
leading Somalia down to the path where it is today, where if it was not once again for the Turks playing such a significant role, uh, the society as a whole would probably not be as advanced as it is today. And certainly the, the conflict in the Ogaden uh, helped to drive from power along with the conflict in neighboring Eritrea, uh, the so-called Derg, uh, which was a military-oriented regime under Mengistu Haile Mariam. Uh, I recall when I was living in Zimbabwe in the 1990s, I used to walk by his well-guarded residence on a daily basis on my way to the Zimbabwe archives. In other words, he too was driven out of power uh, as with the, the, the conflict over the Ogaden being a reason. Of course, there were domestic reasons as well as any Ethiopian can tell you. So once again, we'll probably have to return uh, to this question, but let that suffice for now. Yeah, thank you for, I should have looked at the time before posing such a, a historically complex question to you. Well, Dr. Horn, thank you again for coming on, uh, on the Activist News Network on Around the Horn, and we look forward to having you back next week. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. That was excellent.